without further ado, I'd like to get started with our event. And as mentioned, the first component will be a special presentation uh, from Erin Kenny. We're very pleased to have Erin with us today. Welcome, Erin. Erin's uh, the gender-based violence specialist within the humanitarian branch of the UN Population Fund, UNFPA. Uh, she has an important global level responsibility and as part of that and as a complement to that, since joining UNFPA, Erin has responded to numerous emergencies across the world, uh, including uh, but not limited to in Liberia, Darfur, DRC, Uganda, Chad, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, Nepal, Pakistan, Haiti, South Sudan, Mali, just to name a few. Uh, she's really been uh, all over the world uh, dealing with the challenge of gender-based violence. Erin is also an adjunct professor at Columbia University, where she teaches a master level course on humanitarian policy and practice in the School of International and Public Affairs. Uh, so, Erin, uh, I think uh, without uh, further delay, I'll pass the floor to you. And thanks once again for helping us start off this event uh, with a, a brief presentation. You have the floor. Super, thank you so much. I'm really delighted to be speaking to all of you today and especially happy to see so many familiar faces uh, popping up in the chat box, both old colleagues as well as current UNFPA uh, colleagues. Happy to see everyone and really happy and, and grateful to HAP for uh, the support and organization of this. I think it's, it's a great um, opportunity. So let's, um, let's jump into it. I, I promised I would take no more than 20 minutes to just set the stage for this topic. Uh, essentially, over the next 20 minutes, I'm going to cover three primary learning objectives. The first is just to make sure we're all on the same page with how we're talking about gender-based violence. The second is to understand the principles that guide our work to address gender-based violence in humanitarian contexts. And the third is to just briefly review the elements of effective GDD programming in humanitarian context. Let's just start with a bit of an acronym game. Just as the field of gender violence and emergencies has evolved significantly over the last 30 years, so has our terminology. Early programs to address gender-based violence were really focused on victims of violence or survivors of violence. Since then, the language we use has really evolved. And even now, we concurrently use several synonymous terms to talk about gender-based violence. Um, some of them are, are terms we use to denote subsets of gender-based violence, and some of them we really use synonymously. Many people still use the term violence against women and girls, or VAWG. Many also use the term FGBV to place emphasis on the sexual violence uh, elements of gender-based violence. Uh, we increasingly see the term GBV, i.e., so gender-based violence in emergencies. And then uh, some people really want to maintain a stronger focus on particular elements of gender-based violence or on the resilience of particularly affected populations. So, for example, the International Rescue Committee has defined their GBV programming under the umbrella of women's protection and empowerment. And increasingly, we see specific programming that's dedicated to conflict-related sexual violence or alternatively sexual violence in conflict. I'm going to do my best to avoid speaking in acronyms during this webinar, except for GBV, which is the most commonly used acronym to talk about this issue. But please do uh, let me know if there's any acronym that you see on the screen or that I use that you're not familiar with, and I will uh, go ahead and define it. Attention to the issue of gender-based violence and emergencies has continued to increase in recent years. But action to advance this field has been going on for over 30 years. Let's look at some of the key programming and policy milestones. We'll see on your screen a uh, handout that um, several of us have put together over the years to kind of document all of the progress that's been made since the mid-80s. I'm not going to go one by one, but you'll be able to download this handout as well and just have it on hand so you can see some of the things that we're highlighting as particularly critical to the field. 
In the 80s and early 90s, there were key conferences that started to acknowledge the need for a focus on displaced women and to situate gender-based violence in the context of reproductive health. UNHCR was really at the forefront of this, developing guidelines, putting a senior coordinator for refugee women in place, um, developing special victims of violence programs. The first dedicated gender-based violence program or victims of violence program was in Tanzania in 1996, which comes from Ted Turner. UNHCR subcontracted the International Rescue Committee uh, for this inaugural program and then followed up with uh, additional projects throughout Africa uh, in the 1990s. The 1990s were also really significant because of the media coverage on two major crises, uh, Rwanda and Bosnia, that specifically focused on the use of sexual violence tactically as a weapon of war or as a tactic of displacement. In 2000, uh, really significantly, there was passage of UN Security Council Resolution 1325 on Women, Peace, and Security. Many of you should already be familiar with this resolution, and if you're not, I would encourage you to become familiar with it. It's a really foundational resolution to situating the work um, that we do in the Security Council and within the UN system. In 2002, a really significant event um, that happened then was the sexual exploitation and abuse scandal that was revealed in West Africa. What was unique about this was not that the sexual exploitation and abuse was happening, this had been happening for years, but that it had been documented um, and kind of proven on such a wide scale. Uh, this really galvanized, really motivated the humanitarian community to pay more attention to this issue and particularly to the issue of sexual exploitation and abuse by UN staff. In, uh, you know, throughout the early 2000s, there were additional technical consultations and additional guidelines developed. Uh, most significantly in 2005, the first version of the Interagency Standing Committee uh, Gender-Based Violence Guidelines were produced, the Purple Book, which I'll talk about a little bit later. This was really focused on ensuring that there was comprehensive action across the humanitarian community, not restricted to people who wear the GBV specialist hat. In 2007, a network of UN entities was formed called UN Action Against Sexual Violence and Conflict. It was formed based on an outcome of the first ever international symposium on sexual violence and conflict, which was hosted by UNFPA and the gov government of Belgium in Brussels in 2006. Uh, UN Action is focused on both policy advocacy and uh, some programmatic support specific to the issue of conflict-related sexual violence and was really instrumental in the passage of several specific Security Council resolutions looking at conflict-related sexual violence. Um, significantly, UN Security Council Resolution 1820, which was the first Security Council resolution to recognize sexual violence as, as a security issue that required a security response. Um, in 2009, passage of Security Council Resolution 1888, which established the Office of the Special Representative on Sexual Violence and Conflict. It's currently um, uh, 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 Bangora, Zana Pawa Bangora. And then several subsequent resolutions um, continued through the, you know, 2010, 2013. 2013 was a really big year. Uh, as many of you know, a lot of attention to this issue. There were passage of two additional resolutions, one on conflict-related sexual violence and one on women, peace, and security as a follow-up to 1325. There was a massive conference, the Prevention of Sexual Violence Initiative um, by the United Kingdom's Foreign Commonwealth Office. And uh, also the United Kingdom launched the call to action on, on gender-based violence and emergencies with a high-level communique that was signed on by many heads of offices that many of you represent. Uh, several other initiatives have happened since then, and this year the big initiative is will be the launch of the revised ISC GBV guidelines, which I'll talk about a little bit more. All right, Marcus, I'm going to go to the next slide. So let's define, let's look at the definition of GBV a little bit. Gender-based violence is an umbrella term for any harmful act that is perpetrated against a person's will 
that is based on socially ascribed gender differences between males and females. Gender-based violence includes acts that inflict physical, sexual, or mental harm or suffering, threats of such acts, coercion, and other deprivations of liberty. These acts can occur in public or private. We're going to unpack some of the concepts in this, in this uh, definition over the next couple of slides. So the first thing I want to talk about is why the focus on gender? So as we know, gender is the social construction of difference between men and women, and between different categories of males and females, including by age, economic status, race, sexual orientation, etc. Gender is, quite simply, the term used to denote the social characteristics assigned to girls, boys, women, and men. These social characteristics are constructed on the basis of many different factors, including age, religion, nationality, ethnic and social origin, etc. They can differ both within and between cultures and define identities, status, roles, responsibility, and power relations among members of any society or culture. Importantly, gender is subject to variations in time and space. It isn't fixed or inevitable. It considers social change in response to events, trends, and movements. Neither males nor females can be said to have exclusive or essential characteristics. Gender is learned through socialization. It's not static or innate, but evolves to respond to the changes in the social, political, and cultural environment. This is particularly important when considering how gender roles can evolve in the context of a humanitarian crisis. Constructions of gender are heavily influenced by who has power in a given culture or society and how that power is used. This includes decision making and political power, as well as access to and control over economic resources. It's important to remember that gender is a neutral term, neither good nor bad, right nor wrong. For some, the word gender has become associated with women's issues and women's programs. Feminists, and for some people, gender has become a word that connotes exclusion or hatred of men. In fact, gender refers to both males and females. We use the term gender-based violence very intentionally. Specifically, gender-based violence moves beyond describing the act to acknowledging its primary underpinning factor. The term recognizes that violence is an aspect of gender roles, power relationships, and particularly the subordination of women and their related exploitation. In order to address violence, one also needs to address issues of gender inequality. The term encourages action to focus on the societal and relational context in which violence occurs, and therefore begs the inclusion of men, women, boys, and girls. The women and girls suffer the majority of gender-based abuses around the world. In situations of conflict, uh, in particular, men and boys may suffer tremendously as a result of their gender role expectations and may themselves be victims of some forms of gendered violence. But let's talk about that for a second, because I know that this is a big issue within the humanitarian community right now. Let's think a little bit about why the term refers primarily to violence against women and girls. We know that even though boys and men may be exposed to gendered violence, women's inferior status virtually everywhere in the world means that they are its primary targets. Gender discrimination is not only a cause of many forms of violence against women and girls, but also contributes to the widespread acceptance and invisibility of such violence so that perpetrators are not held accountable and survivors are discouraged from speaking out and accessing support. The gender of the perpetrator and the victim is central not only to the motivation for the violence, but also to the ways in which society condones or responds to the violence. Whereas violence against men is more likely to be committed by an acquaintance or stranger, Women more often experience violence at the hands of those who are well known to them, intimate partners, family members, etc. In addition, widespread gender discrimination and gender inequality often result in women and girls being exposed to multiple forms of gender-based violence throughout their lives. 
including secondary GBV as a result of a primary incident. What I mean by that is, is you know, abuse when they report or being forced to marry a perpetrator or um, dying as a result of violence. What about men and boys? Let's get into it. Gendered vulnerabilities can put anyone, men, women, boys, and girls, at heightened risk for violence. Humanitarians must ensure care and support for all survivors. We know that the language of gender-based violence, though initially devised to really denote violence against women and girls, is increasingly being used to address gendered violence against men and boys, recognizing that gendered vulnerabilities can put anyone at increased risk for violence. Humanitarians have an obligation to provide care and support for all survivors, regardless of their sex or gender identity, and to proactively mitigate the risks for all affected populations. At the same time, it is important to recognize the pervasive failures of the humanitarian community to effectively protect women and girls and pr promote their self-sufficiency. While attention to gendered violence against men, boys, and other populations is overdue, this cannot be at the expense of a collective need to do more for and with affected women and girls. Violence against lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, or intersex individuals constitutes GBV when it is driven by a desire to punish those seen as defying gender norms. Lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and intersex individuals are at particular risk of abuse due to their lack of conformity to prescribed gender roles and mosaities. Furthermore, humanitarian actors' own discomfort with working with these populations and the lack of targeted programming mean that they are often completely ignored in humanitarian response. Further compounding their abuse, LGBTI individuals may not seek out services if they believe that they will be discriminated against, treated disrespectfully, or even turned away from care. So what is GBV specifically? Many people often uh, only associate gender-based violence with rape or only the physical elements. In fact, GBV includes many things some of which are physical, some are emotional, and some may be economic. There's a great uh, glossary of terms that will help you to understand all of these different elements of GBV that can be found in one of the resources that I'll talk about later. It's a, a companion guide to an e-learning course on managing GBV in emergencies. Um, so it, I'm not going to unpack each of these terms, but there are some good resources out there for you. At its most basic level, designing GBV programs means considering four things. We want to know the causal relationship between the types of gender-based violence believed to be occurring, the vulnerabilities of various population subsets, so are elderly women more at risk, are young girls, are young boys, so really considering all of the um, particular vulnerabilities in that context, and the nature and phase of the crisis. Is this uh, acute? Is it a conflict? Is it a disaster? Is it protracted? What's the role or implications of the government? All of these different things. And then, of course, we need to understand what's available to us. What kind of assets? What's our funding situation? What kind of uh, human resources do we have? What's the service landscape like? Who are our champions in country? Do we have support? Based on all of these factors, our programs are going to look really different in Syria or the Philippines or the Central African Republic. Oftentimes, we're asked to provide proof that gender-based violence is happening as justification for funding and action, especially in the early days of an emergency. Documenting gender-based violence incidents is challenging even in the most stable of contexts. In crisis contexts, where systems of support have been massively disrupted, or where the political environment encourages survivors to stay hidden rather than risk further abuse, the likelihood of having data on GBV incidents beyond anecdotal reports is very slim. 
We must take action to address gender-based violence from the onset of a crisis, even in the absence of this evidence. In the first weeks of the response, GBV actors can analyze secondary data and gather relevant sex and age disaggregated information from available cluster or sector assessments and can facilitate a rapid assessment of risks and vulnerabilities to provide a solid picture of plausible risks and likely types of GBV believed to be occurring. This can serve as the foundation for more comprehensive programming. However, life-saving actions to mitigate risks and care for survivors cannot wait for even this analysis to be produced. It is unethical and violates our humanitarian principles. Addressing gender-based violence is a humanitarian obligation, as reinforced by our humanitarian principles, humanitarian standards and guidelines, GBV-related protection needs as identified by affected populations, international and national law, and various UN Security Council resolutions. The 2014 IASC Statement on the Centrality of Protection similarly reinforces this all-encompassing obligation to act. All programming to address gender-based violence should be grounded in these core principles. Preventing and mitigating gender-based violence involves promoting gender equality and beliefs and norms that foster respectful, nonviolent behavior. Safety, respect, confidentiality, and non-discrimination in relation to survivors and those at risk must be considered at all times. Participation and partnership are the cornerstones of effective GBV prevention and response. GBV-related interventions should be context-specific and enhance outcomes to enhance outcomes and do no harm. There are two uh, main categories of GBV programming. There's mainstream programming, which is also known as horizontal programming. And there's specialized programming, which is also known as vertical programming. Let's take a, take a look at the first one, at GBV mainstreaming. Mainstream programming is done by all actors and requires limited to no specialized training or funding resources. The aim is to avoid creating new risks and reduce existing risks as relevant to that sector of engagement and to provide timely, ethical, and safe response for GBV survivors. Actions to mainstream GBV are not extensive. What's required is application of a basic set of minimum standards while adhering to the core principles reviewed earlier. Now let's look at specialized programming. Specialized programming is done by GBV specialists and includes both prevention and response. On the response side, specialized programming focuses on direct service delivery using a survivor-centered approach. This can include psychosocial support, clinical care, legal support, economic reintegration, and case management. I mentioned earlier this really um, critical guidance that was developed in 2005. These are the ISC uh, guidelines for gender-based violence interventions in humanitarian settings which were really the Bible for many of us doing this work for many years uh, for mainstreaming. As you may have heard when I spoke earlier, you may already know because hopefully you were involved, we are in the very final stages of, um, of the revised version. They're just sitting with the IASC now for endorsement. Um, these will be launched in the coming month. Uh, it took us about two years to develop, to revise. It's a bit longer than we were anticipating, but we feel really great about the final product. This is a process led by UNICEF and UNFPA on behalf of the gender-based violence area of responsibility. We had an advisory board of 16 organizations with extensive experience in addressing GBV in humanitarian settings. And we led a really inclusive revision process. We had four global reviews. We had over 200 global reviewers who provided feedback, direct dialogue with over 100 GBV experts from around the world, 428 survey responses from 66 countries, 10 field visits to review uh, preliminary content and pilot 
trainings on the guidelines, uh, and those reached about 1,000 ind individuals. The revised guidelines contain recommendations that have been approved by and are relevant to a wide, wide array of humanitarian actors. The goal of the revised guidelines is to support humanitarian stakeholders in fulfilling their responsibility to protect by reducing risk, including through preparedness, promoting resilience, including by strengthening national and community-based systems, and aiding recovery, including by seeking lasting solutions to gender-based violence prevention and response. There's also a growing library of resources to support specialized GBV programming and coordination. Here are a few. I'm not going to go through each of these, but hopefully you'll be able to see their titles. And we can also, I can work with markets to make sure you're able to find as many of these as you are interested in accessing. Most of these can be found on the GBV AOR's website, uh, which is about to pop up. There it is on the bottom uh, right corner of that slide. These represent a variety of tools and guidelines. So some of them, like I said, are specific to coordination. Some are specific to designing a program. Some are specific to elements of a program, like management, clinical management of rape survivors. Um, some are training manuals, and some are uh, specific to kind of broader programming areas of work or establishing things like standard operating procedures. So just to cap, this is my last slide. What are the key messages I want you guys to take away from this presentation? The first is that gendered vulnerabilities can put anyone, men, women, boys, and girls, at heightened risk for violence. Humanitarians must ensure care and support for all survivors. However, women's inferior status virtually everywhere in the world means that they are its primary targets. Preventing and mitigating gender-based violence involves promoting gender equality and beliefs and norms that foster respectful, nonviolent behavior. GBV-related interventions should be context-specific to enhance outcomes and do no harm. Finally, all humanitarian personnel have the responsibility to assume GBV is taking place, to treat it as a serious and life-threatening protection issue. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you so much, Erin. And it was, uh, I think, an excellent presentation because monitoring the uh, the questions that we that we had coming in during your presentation, we had a couple of people ask questions of clarification and then write back later that you covered it. So I think as far as uh, clarification questions go, we're, uh, we're doing just fine and we can actually move on to our active uh, discussion. So um, to expand a little bit on how we're going to structure uh, this discussion, it's going to be in four main parts. Uh, we're going to be uh, looking first at if